Hi, I'm Father Chris Alar, one of the Marians of the Immaculate Conception, coming to you from the National Shrine of the Divine Mercy in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, and welcome to Living Divine Mercy here on EWTN. You know, last week we started a great program about the Eucharist and the power of Holy Communion, and our guest was Vinnie Flynn, famous singer and author who wrote Seven Secrets of the Eucharist. Now, let us continue our discussion because, unfortunately, we ran out of time after secret number three. And let's have Vinny explain to us the rest of the seven secrets of the Eucharist. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. You know, it's an honor. We had Vinny Flynn on our previous show talking about the seven secrets of the Eucharist. And Vinny, thank you that your schedule worked out and my schedule worked out that we actually filmed it right here in the same setting. So we're going to bring to you now part two, which is the continuation of the book that Vinny wrote about seven secrets of the Eucharist. So Vinny, let's pick back up to where we left off on these seven secrets. So our fourth secret is the Eucharist, Vinny, you say, is not just one miracle. So we talked about the Mass. Now let's talk about miracles. Right. For, you know, when, when I was a kid, I, it was all one thing to me. I didn't think in terms of details of everything that has to go into this great mystery. I just thought, okay, I really believe this is this. what looks like bread is really the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Okay, I believe that. It's as if God was this great musician and he went poof and all, all this happens. And and then, you know, when I when I read Pope Leo the Thirteenth, oh, my, my favorite, you know, yeah. that that this is a variety of miracles, and in the Eucharist alone, just in the Eucharist, all supernatural realities are contained, in a remarkable that's what Leo richness. The 13th says. Yes, yeah. in a remarkable richness and a whole variety of miracles, one after another. Only they don't come in succession; it's instantaneous, all at once. So, so in your words, wow, forgive me, but you're a mere creature. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So at the words of a mere creature, God totally changes what looks like bread, what was bread, into his whole being yeah. and presents it to us. Yeah. And heaven and earth are united in that action. And, you know, it's fascinating you mentioned because, okay, you think about it, we have transubstantiation, then becomes the real presence of Christ. Then heaven and earth are all united. But it's all at one moment. All it's all one at moment. one instant. Yeah. So this is the beautiful gift. That and it's have. not repeated. Yeah. You know, there's, there's 100 masses going on at a particular time all over the world, for instance, let's yeah. say. Well, if this isn't being repeated 100 times. You know, it's it's that one liturgy that we talked about is is being made present in yeah. each of those places. So that miracle is happening all over the world at the same time, because in each place, the people in that particular church or place are being lifted up into he into the heavenly liturgy. Yeah. And experiencing all those miracles. And, you know, to go uh, in line with what your book says, and Pope uh, Benedict Emeritus XVI said, in spirit of the liturgy, it's like the roof of the church opens up and the angels, and you think of Jacob's ladder, and right. the angels and the saints ascend and descend, and heaven and earth are united. And you mentioned Scott Hahn before, right. and it's where the mass is on every page of the book of Revel uh, Revelation, but most of all, the heaven or uh, the mass is heaven on earth. Right. We do go to heaven, Scott Hahn. So yeah. we do go to heaven when we go to mass, every mass. That's no matter crazy. how bad the music is, no matter what's going on. <laughs> or my singing. <laughs> right, right, or the homily. Or the you know? homily. <laughs> you know, but we're in heaven at every Mass. That's beautiful. So that's our fourth secret. Now let's, Vinny, go on to the fifth secret. Again, we're talking about Vinny Flynn's book, The Seven Secrets of the Eucharist. So let's go now on to the fifth secret, and that is we just don't receive. It's We think, Vinny, we receive Holy Communion, that we're some kind of back to that passiveness. Right, exactly. But, but we're active. Right, yeah. It's like uh, it's like some. we seem to think that God's doing all the work. You know, well, it's the same for me. Every time I receive, it's, it's going to be just the same, you know, because I'm just taking something in. God's doing all the work. He's providing it, you know. And that is very passive. What Pope Benedict says that what we need to do is enter into communion. And it's that I'm saying the word that way to emphasize yes. what the word means. Union it means Christ. union with. Yeah. So I'm not supposed to be just mindlessly taking something in. 
I need to be active, just as in a marriage, for instance. As marriage isn't 50-50, it's 100-100. Wow. you got to enter yeah. into it. The more you enter into it, the more you're going to get And you know, many we hear from our non-Catholic brethren, God bless you if you're watching and, and you're not Catholic, and we understand uh, your love for the passion of Christ, but we will say, or your love of Christ, but we'll hear often say, you just need a personal relationship with Jesus. You don't need all this other stuff. Right. Well, this is the way for that Absolutely. personal relationship. It doesn't get more personal than this. <laughs> no. It's true communion. It's that true union with communion. Christ. Yeah. Right. And so it's it's important that we what the word Pope Benedict uses is that we enter into communion. We don't yeah. receive. That's not a strong enough word. We enter into is active. We yeah. enter into union with Christ. And I love your quote, if I remember cor- correctly, it was St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi that said, the moments of foul communion are the most important moments of your life. Why is that? It's a continuation of the entering in. I don't just receive and then go back to my seat and start thinking about the football game again, you know, or my taxes or something like that. You know, this, this, this is when Christ himself has become Flesh of my flesh. He's taken flesh in me. He's living in me. As we saw when we talked about the, one of the earlier secrets, the Trinity has come to dwell inside me. I don't want to waste this moment. Yes. You know, talk to, this is the best time for me to talk to God. Don't to run out the, the door. Don't, don't run, run out, out the door. Don't run out the door. <laughs> right. The, the, the best example for me is, is um, uh, St. Cyril of Jerusalem has this wonderful, wonderful phrase where, and he kind of echoes Pope Benedict. Pope Benedict says this act of eating is really a meeting between two persons. I like that. Where one interpenetrates the other. The two persons become one in this interpenetrating each other. Let's go on now to secret number six. And that sixth secret is every reception is different. So yes. explain that one for us, Vinny. Well, again, when I, I always would think of that I'm because I'm I'm not doing anything. It's God, but the same thing is happening every time I receive. The same thing is happening, but that's not true. The church teaches has always taught that that every sacrament, the fruit of every sacrament, is entirely dependent on my disposition. Yeah. So, so especially the, to so, be in a state of grace. Especially right, yeah. but it, but my whole disposition. And so I'm going to give an example. We we talked last time about how we really need to enter in. And the best example that I think I've ever come across from that is, is from Padre Pio. He said, when Mass is over, I remained in, with, thanks, in, with Jesus in thanksgiving. The heart of Jesus and my own were fused. No longer were two hearts beating, but only one. My own heart had disappeared as a drop of water is lost in the ocean. My joy was so intense and deep that I could bear it no more, and tears of happiness poured down my cheeks. Now, this is holy communion. This is, he is holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. It's not just a piece of bread. He's holy yeah. receiving, holy entering into union with Christ. Yeah. That's, that's one way. That's one type of reception. Or there's what St. Thomas calls the false person, the false person receives communion and and, what he, and gets no benefit. Yeah, and that's it's, I've had people say that's outrageous. That couldn't be the church doesn't teach that. And say yes, it does. Yeah, and, and, and Paul warns us that if we receive unworthily, we bring condemnation. We bring but condemnation. That means it's more than a piece of bread. As exactly. I always say, if you ever see me eat a piece of pizza, that's unworthy. I'm wolfing it down, racing to my next <laughs> meeting. That's just because it's a piece of bread. Right. Paul would never bring condemnation upon us or say we're bringing condemnation if it's just a piece of bread. Right. It's He's, more. It says we need to discern yeah. the the body. We need to recognize yeah. what's happening. So we need. And as, as um, Augustine says, we need to first worship, then receive. We have to adore, realize what it is we're hence receiving. Hence Eucharistic adoration. Yeah, hence Eucharistic adoration, et cetera. And even just before we receive, to prepare for receiving this. You know, because the, the, uh, that statement that in a false person, the sacrament has no effect. There's no sacramental effect. It's still a sacrament because I believe this is the body and blood of Christ. But I'm I'm not caring about what I'm what what's happening in the, in the in the same sense. As the gospel tells us, we don't have that fertile soil. A seed planted on on an unfertile soil or a rock isn't going to germinate. Right. It's, it's not. Saint Thomas tells us a false person is one who is not longing for union with Christ in his heart. When he receives and trying to remove every obstacle to that. So I'm a false person if I'm not thinking about 
what's happening when I go up to receive. And I'm not trying, yearning to be united with Christ. Mm. So that's the most important thing. So that can make us scrupulous. People can say, oh, I better not receive because I'll never get to that extent. Yeah. You know, but that's not the point. To me, it's exciting because that means I can receive more worthily, more completely tomorrow than I did today. I just have to focus more on really longing to be united with Christ. And that's the the key is the desire. The desire. desire. Exactly. Very good. And so that brings us really to the realization that it's like baptism of desire even a spiritual communion because if we are sick or we're bedridden and we can't get a priest we can still try in our spiritual communion which you're giving which away is, you're giving yeah. away secret seven. Oh, well you know what <laughs> with that we'll lead you to the next secret let's talk about that secret right now and that secret seven which is Vinny there's no you say there's no limit to the number of times we can receive now I'm always told they can only receive <laughs> twice that's right. physically but you're talking spiritual that was an attention grabber I put that title on just to <laughs> shock people so they'd pay attention yeah but, but 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 it is real because if I understand what receiving is about then there is no limit I can receive right now we could take 10 seconds and receive the Eucharist spiritually and I always thought spiritual communion was like a consolation prize I can't really receive so I can make a spiritual communion big whoop you know like it never impressed me much until I realized wait a minute this is this is real St. Thomas says again we're back to St. Thomas he says there's two kinds of eating sacramental and spiritual. The spiritual eating is what we were talking about with the last secret. It's when I'm longing for union with Christ in my heart. That's the spiritual eating. And that that has to be there in order for the sacramental eating to have any effect on me. I don't get any of the fruits of that sacrament unless the spiritual eating is there where I'm longing to receive Christ into my heart. And where spiritual community comes in is even if I can't receive sacramentally, But if I want to receive sacramentally and I'm desiring for that union, then I can receive as much fruit in some ways. Now, that's not an excuse not to go to Mass on Sunday. It's definitely not an excuse because um, what what, uh, Maximilian Colby, for instance, teaches is that spiritual communion is not just saying, okay, Lord, I want to be united with you. Come into my heart. That's not spiritual communion. That's a pious prayer. Spiritual community is when I have an intense longing to receive you sacramentally. But since I can't do that sacramentally yet now, Church is please come into, yeah, right, whatever yeah. reason, yeah. you know, uh, um, that come into my heart. So if that, if sometimes, I'll give you an example. Let's say I really am, am longing to receive communion and I, 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 I mess up through some sin or especially in the old days when we had to fast for so long. I I had something to eat. I can't receive. So here I am. I'm watching everybody else go up to receive communion. It's killing me. I really want to receive that sacrament, but I know I can't. Well, then I get into my, well, yesterday maybe I received and I I wanted to receive, but I wasn't, I wasn't really focused on it completely. So yes, I received a lot of people, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, Well, it happens. But, but today I can't really go up and receive. So now my in, my desire has intensified. Wow. My spiritual eating is off the charts So God can now. take a greater good out of a bad situation. Exactly. Yeah. And I can actually receive because my spiritual eating is what it's really mostly wow. about. Interesting. As Maximilian Kobe says, I can get just as much grace at times. That's powerful. Because it depends on how much I'm longing for, again, I want to use this pun, holy communion, H-O-L-Y, yeah. to be really holy that union has to be holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y. I have to be completely united with That's God. Great. Now it's a holy union. You know, Vinny, I did a talk uh, just last week on uh, what I feel are the three greatest saints of our current times, John Paul II, St. Faustina, and Padre Pio. And you mentioned in your book that Padre Pio and St. Faustina really exemplified this receiving fully, repetitively, as unlimited spiritual unlimited. communion. Unlimited. Faustina was even... She she even came to know, the Lord let her know, that his presence in her did not it did not vanish after 15 minutes or wow. whatever, that it, he remained present with her yeah. until her next, next communion. communion. I remember. Yeah. So she was in a constant state 
of spiritual, spiritual communion. communion. Unlimited. Unlimited. Well, with that, Vinny, I wanted to say thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to have Vinny with us here. And if you haven't had a chance to read some of his book, uh, uh, I always look back to Father Kosicki, uh, Vinny, and uh, Father Seraphim as kind of my mentors. Reading their books is outstanding. And you can get this copy of The Seven Secrets of the Eucharist right here on the EWTN Religious Catalog. So you'll see it on the bottom of our screen. Give them a call, uh, order it online, and you can get really an eye-opening, beautiful description in easy-to-understand language of the source and summit of our faith. Thank you again, Vinny, and God bless you. Thanks. Bye-bye. It's always great to hear such a powerful witness of the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. And speaking of the real presence, let's watch a video now done by one of our employees and Marian helpers named Owen, who took this message to his parish in Hudson, New York. I come to adoration on Monday and Friday. So it's like a pillar holding up my week of chaos, noise, confusion. I come to adoration to be still. I come to the adoration chapel every week because the King of Kings is waiting here. Uh, bueno, vengo acá a la adoración de Eucaristía todas las semanas porque Tengo un propósito en la vida. How has Eucharistic adoration affected my spiritual life? Well, for one, um, when I come to the Adoration Chapel, it's, it's so quiet and it's so peaceful. As you come more often, you start to relax into that peacefulness, into that quiet, and you realize, hmm, maybe this is what I should be having all the time in my life, and I should start to maybe get rid of some of the noise in my life. It makes me nice all. and makes me like God. I love God more. I have been awakened to a much greater appreciation of the Eucharist and I'm participating when heaven meets earth. I'd invite anyone to come to the chapel here. You can kneel, you can sit, you can pray. You can pour your heart out to the Lord. You can tell him all your cares, all your concerns. You can pray a rosary, divine mercy, or sometimes I take my beads and I just continuously say, Jesus, Son of the living God, have mercy on us. Y eso me motivó a seguir en adelante, a orar, a leer la, las escrituras y meditarlas. Y eso me aumenta cada día, cada momento. Y esa podría ser Eh, mi experiencia podría ser útil a alguien más. Well, thank you, Owen, very much for that inspiring video. It's great to see people coming to the churches, seeking our Lord in the Eucharist. And in fact, if you've ever been here to our National Shrine of Divine Mercy, you'll see that we as priests bringing the presence of God to you, the pilgrims, especially through Eucharistic processions. Now, speaking of processions, this reminds me of a story that I incurred myself with the Eucharist back right after my ordination in 2014. After being ordained, I requested to be able to go to Canada and spend some time with some First Nations, Native American people up on a reservation in Northern Canada. Now, I had heard that they hadn't had a priest or a mass in four years, so I was excited and arrived on Corpus Christi. 
Now, as we know, the tradition on Corpus Christi is to do a Eucharistic procession. So afterwards, I did, with the Eucharist and the monstrance, processing out with several women and children who had attended Mass. Unfortunately, not too many men because several of them had been losing their faith and had turned to pagan ways and even shaman and type of pagan worship. But God is not to be outdone. Sometimes he proves himself, especially with the real presence. Well, what happened as we were processing through the reservation, I noticed there were two natives on the porch, two young men, and they began screaming profanities in English directed at me and the Eucharist, telling us to basically get out. Well, continuing to process with the monstrance and moving forward, they actually stepped down from the porch trying to block our way. Well, at one point, one of them reached up what I believed to desecrate the Eucharist. As he attempted to reach up and grab it, I held tight, held tight to the, to the shaft of the monstrance, and this native grabbed a Native American or First Nations grabbed the shaft or tried to of the monstrance and suddenly his hand was thrown from the monstrance completely off. He couldn't touch it. And he fell to his knees and he was screaming. And I asked later to the ladies that were there, the, the women First Nations, they said, he was screaming, my hand, my hand. What actually happened was his hand was burned from trying to touch the Eucharist, what we believe was to desecrate it. Now, after that happened, all the people behind were in amazement, all instantly going into worship and praising God and giving thanksgiving for the real presence. And so sometimes, as I said, God allows us to be able to experience this, sometimes miraculous forms. And so that is what we, as priests, should all believe and you as the laity can see in this gift God gives us in Holy Communion. Now, let's read about in the scriptures that this real presence of Christ is not just some man-made tradition, but is actually given to us by Christ himself in the scriptures. The cup of blessing which we bless, is it not a participation in the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one bread, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. The mystery of the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist was central to St. Faustina and to her spiritual director, Blessed Father Michael Sapochko. Father Sapochko writes, that the Eucharist is a masterpiece of the love of our Lord. It reveals the love of Jesus for each of the members of the church, for he gives himself to each of them. Desiring to be the source of the divine life in them, Jesus takes on the form of nourishment to come close to us and penetrate into the recesses of our hearts, where he exalts and enriches us and gives himself to us as a pledge of future happiness. The effects of the Eucharist are a most clear proof that the infinite mercy of God is there present, for the Lord works with such freedom, only by reason of his boundless compassion for human wretchedness. He says, I believe in the miracle performed each day in the Holy Mass. It is a continuous and miraculous multiplication of the angelic bread and pouring of graces on the zealous and on lukewarm souls. Now that we've heard about the Eucharist in Scripture, let's hear Father Seraphim and Father George Kosicki explain what the Eucharist meant to one of the greatest saints, St. Faustina. Well, her whole life was centered really on the Eucharist. From her earliest years, she was longing to be present to the Lord in the Eucharist, to be at Mass, mm. to, to be in church, and whenever she could, she rushed down there. So that the Eucharist really became the very core of her life. And when she went out to work for various people, she would always sing. She was a very mm. joyful person. 
And uh, invariably, the song, her most beloved song, was one in honor of the Holy Eucharist. Mm. And the last lady she worked for, whose husband was Jewish and all the children were Jewish, who then became uh, Christians, and but were not churchgoers. And yet, she worked there for a whole year for them. And they loved her like their own family. And they said, if there's one thing we remember, it's the song she sang. And the translation, the rough translation, which is poetic in Polish, yeah. it goes like this. Jesus hidden in the blessed sacrament, him I must adore. Renounce everything for his sake. Live only by his love. Mm. And then the uh, other verses goes, he gives himself completely. With us, he took a presidence here. Let us dedicate our life to him for his divine glory. By faith, we must humble our senses and our intellect because it's not bread we have here. It's my God, my Jesus. Mm -hmm. And the lady said, come to think of it. And this is what she said during her declaration, her as a, wit a formal witness to Sister Faustina's virtues. She said, come to think of it. That was the whole program of her life. She just lived for Jesus in the Eucharist. I fear life on days when I do not receive Holy Communion. I fear my own self. Jesus, concealed in the host, is everything to me. From the tabernacle, I draw strength, power, courage, and light. Here, I seek consolation in time of anguish. I would not know how to give glory to God if I did not have the Eucharist in my heart. When the priest exposed the Blessed Sacrament and the choir began to sing, the rays from the image pierced the sacred host and spread out all over the world. Then I heard these words, these rays of mercy will pass through you just as they have passed through this host and they will go out through all the world. At these words, Profound joy invaded my soul. Well, thank you again for joining us on this week's episode of Living Divine Mercy, and join us next week as we talk about the Christian roots of thanksgiving. Until then, keep focused on God's most important attribute, mercy. And may he bless you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.